Uh, we're looking at predictions of the king, and the one that we're looking at today is prediction of the king's birth. It's found in Isaiah 7, but we're not going to start there. We're going to start in the New Testament and work our way back. In fact, the king's birth was first announced to Mary. To Mary. And you recall in uh, the, the Gospel of Luke, in the first chapter, it says, In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. They were engaged, all right? Engagements were pretty important back then because to get out of an engagement, you literally had to get a divorce. They were binding. Yet, if, if you were an engaged person and your engaged fiancé died, you were considered a widow or a widower. It was that binding. And, and so this virgin is pledged. She's in the engagement, and she's a virgin. And we'll find later it means that she's not had any relations with a man. So it says, A virgin was pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, who was a descendant of David. You see, in order to be a king, you had to be a descendant of David. It turns out that both Mary and Joseph are descendants of David. And it says, and the virgin's name was Mary. The name Mary goes all the way back to the Old Testament. The name Miriam, which was Moses' sister, and was a very popular name in the, in, in the promised land. In fact, it's still a popular name. There are still many people named Mary. Uh, we even have at least one in our congregation today, Mary, all right? And so it's a very popular name. And so Mary, uh, the messenger actually comes to Mary. And she, this messenger says, And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. Wouldn't you like that? God's angel coming to you and saying, Hey, highly favored. You know what the word favored is in the, in the Greek te Testament? It's the word Highly graced. It's the idea of giving unmerited favor. You have this favor, but you don't deserve it. Not even Mary deserved it. It was a gracious act of God that out of all of the women in history, that she would be born at that time to be the mother of our Lord. She was highly favored. Graced by God, be that chosen young virgin to carry Messiah. I want to suggest to you that she's not the only one highly favored. You're highly favored too. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've been graced by God and you are highly favored and God has selected you out of all humanity to be you and to receive his favor. He's been gracious to you. Watch what it says. And the Lord is with you. Wow. Stop, pause for a moment, think about that. If I am highly favored like she is highly favored, then the Lord is with me too. The Lord is with me too. Jesus said, I am with you always even to the end of the age. Other places it tells us you cannot escape his presence. He is always with you. Now in this passage, it's got a heightened meaning because an angel has actually appeared, not a preacher to tell you that you're highly favored, but an angel crashes into her experience of life and says, you are highly favored because the Lord is with you. And the maiden Mary, she responds with great trouble. She says, uh, she was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Why did God send an angel to crash into my experience in order to tell me I'm highly favored? For the same reason he had a preacher crash into your experience today to tell you that you too are highly favored in order to be the recipients of the salvation of our God. Wow. 
So she's a little taken back by this angel's presence, and immediately the angel said to her, what all angels say when they appear to somebody, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor. There it is again. God is gracious to you. Sometimes we live our lives in fear of God, and that's not a bad thing. The fear of the Lord is the the beginning of all knowledge. Our God is a fearful God. But we also should live in in, uh, light of his favor. Now, my dad was not a giant man. My dad was only like 5'7". He was shorter than me. I was taller than my dad. But my dad had what we call Popeye arms. You know what those are? Narrow up here, but big down here. And, and, and his wrist, his wrist was like my thigh. I mean, my, my dad was, he was that kind of guy. Okay, I'm exaggerating just a little bit. But as a child, I had the fear of my dad when he came with the board. You know what the board is? The board of education. It gives you a little discipline. But it was my same dad who I had a good fear of. That when we would watch TV, him and my younger brother would fight over who got to sit next to him up against his little round belly and get all warmed up. Because there was more than just fear there. My dad was a generous, loving, gracious father. And so when you have this passage, he says, Don't be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. You will, you will be with child and give birth to a son And you were to give him the name Jesus. Now, this is quite an announcement that he's making. The messenger's got this announcement. He's making it to this young woman. She's promised to be married. She's not had any relations. And that brings a a, a question in her mind. But he's not done. He said, your child will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. The word most high is a circumlocution. It's where we exchange some words for what we mean. And here it means God. Your child will be called the Son of God, the God the Most High. There is no other God. You're going to have the Son of God. And the Lord will give him the the throne of his father, David. So he's he's going to be a king sitting on a throne. This one who is the Son of God. And he will reign over the house of Jacob. Now, Jacob is a descendant of of, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, then all the tribes of Israel. It's a way of saying he's going to be on the Davidic throne. He's going to be a king. He's going to have a reign. And he's going to have a realm. Subjects. And then he says, and he will reign over the house of the Lord, or the house of Jacob, forever. Now, I don't know about you, but forever is a long time. Forever is a long time. When Jesus takes his throne, I believe at the second advent, we've already, he's already come as king in the first advent, but in the second advent, he takes his throne and he reigns forever and ever and ever. He'll reign for the first thousand years in the millennium, and then at the close of that, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. We saw that from uh, Peter, when we were in the book of Peter. And, and after that, he's going to reign for all eternity. He's going to reign. It says his kingdom will never end. This is the announcement to Mary. And Mary is taking this all in, of course. You know, she's taking this all in. And then she says, uh, everything's fine, but you're mistaken. <laughs> you're mistaken. There's a little glitch here. I remember back, you know, I, you know, I think it was in eighth grade biology. They told us uh, how this all worked. Um, hey, listen, how will this be, Mary said to the angel, since I am a virgin? Literally, the text says, have not known a man. The no one there, you see, Adam knew Eve and, and she had a son. <laughs> this knowledge that's talking about is the way they talked about having sex. She's saying, listen, I've never had sex, so how can this be? This is impossible. You're mistaken. Okay, you're just an angel. You're not God. You're mistaken because this can't be. This can't be. Then the angel answers. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. 
the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The way my mind works, I immediately go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, 1 and verse 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the waters. What? The Spirit of God came upon the creation and then energized it, because after that, we get all kinds of life. If you go down through the rest of the chapter, the Holy Spirit moved in creation. And I believe what he's saying here to, to Mary is God is going to move with the same creative powers and overshadow you just like he did originally in the beginning of all creation. God is going to overshadow you, overpower you. He will come upon you and the Most High will overshadow you so that the one to be born will be called. Now he doesn't use the circumlocution and just say, Son of the Most High, but he says, this is going to be the Son of God. I want to shift gears, move from that announcement to the second announcement. So Gabriel shows up to this young woman and, and tells her that she's going to be pregnant and carry the child of God and the Son of God. And, and, and Joseph to whom she's engaged, doesn't know anything about this. And so a few months go by, and ah, something's starting to happen. She's starting to show. <laughs> and so he's thinking, wait a minute, what did I get myself into here? I thought I was getting myself a good little Jewish girl. And it doesn't appear that way. In fact, in Matthew's Gospel, we pick up after a long genealogy that traces Jesus all the way back to Abraham and David. We have this. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. They were engaged. Same thing it said in Luke. But before they came together, same thing they said in Luke. They had no sexual union. Listen. She was found to be with child, and just like it says in Luke, through the Holy Spirit. But Joseph doesn't know this. You've got to think of it for a moment. That's just a little unfair, don't you think? Poor guy. I mean, he's tormented by this. It says, because he's got misgivings. You see, he's tormented by this. He's got these misgivings. Because Joseph, her husband... Husband is a term used because they're engaged, they've been pledged to be married, and it's a binding contract, and the only way you can get out of it is by a divorce. It says here, but Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. I love that. I know from even the Old Testament that a man's faith is counted for righteousness. He was a believer in God and the Messiah to come, but he hadn't arrived yet. He is a righteous man. He's a godly man. And he didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. Why? Because he had in mind to divorce her quietly. He's going to put her away. He says, if you go back to the Old Testament, you'll read in Deuteronomy chapter 24 that a, a husband could divorce his wife for her indecency. Her unfaithfulness. Here's the situation. He would be a perfect law keeper. He would have a righteous divorce because he would be doing the right thing to let her go. He didn't have to, but it was the right thing he could do. He didn't have to do that. He could forgive her and stay married, or he could technically, because of the indecency, the unfaithfulness, he could divorce her, and he is struggling on the inside he loves her. I know that from the passage because he doesn't make a public spectacle of her. He's trying to find a way where I can maybe send her off quietly to a distant relative and no one will know. She won't suffer disgrace. He's struggling. Do you see where he's at? He's struggling. He loves her and yet he's a righteous man. He perceives a wrong deed being done. It's at this point the messenger pops back in. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Mary had the angel appear to her. 
Joseph gets a dream. And in the dream, the angel said to him, Joseph, son of David. Now that's the same thing it said in Luke. Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. So don't, 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 don't divorce her. Go through and make her your wife. Because what is conceived in her, here it is, same thing it said in Luke, is from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God had overshadowed her. The power of Almighty God impregnated her. And she was carrying this one inside who is going to be the Son of God, both God and man, 100% God, 100% man. He's a 100% God-man. He has one person in two natures. He is only Jesus. He has a divine person, no human person, divine person that operates between a human nature and a divine nature. The two are always distinct, and yet he is just the one God-man. This is mind-boggling stuff here. Don't be afraid to take Mary home to be your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you will give him the name Jesus. You're not going to name him Joseph. Junior. Jesus. Yeshua. Yeshua is Joshua in the Old Testament. I could just see him say, but there are so many Joshua's running around. <laughs> so many Joshua's running around. I have a son named Jeremiah. And when I named him Jeremiah, it means appointed of the Lord. There were no Jeremiah's. I didn't know of a single one. I was like, boy, that's a, you know, Jeremiah. And I didn't want to name him Jeremy because I said one day maybe he'll be a doctor. And who wants to go to Dr. Jeremy? They want to go to Dr. Jeremiah. All right. And so, and so there were none around. Soon as we named him, we move, and where we go, there are Jeremy's everywhere. How does that work? You see, Jesus was a very popular name because it was about jo Joshua. Joshua was the great conquering general under Moses that led them into the promised land and victory, 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 victory. And he says, here, you're going to name your son Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus. And the victory is going to be greater than Joshua ever did. Because he will save his people from their sins. Whoa. Whoa. Here's the miracle. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. What did the Lord say through the prophet? The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel. And because Matthew thinks there's going to be people reading his gospel who aren't Jewish and don't know Hebrew, he translates uh, Emmanuel for us, which means God with us. <laughs> this is really loaded, this verse. God with us. Remember when the angel appeared to, to Mary said, God is with you. But this time he's saying, God is with us. God is with you like, yeah, he sent me here, and God wants you to know that his favor is upon you, and so the Lord is with you. But this one who's going to be God with us is going to be literally God in the flesh. And I know that even more so from John chapter 1, verses 1, and then verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Wow. As, so, for the remainder of my time, I, I want to go back now and explore the quote from Isaiah 7.14 that this is built on and that these two announcements were built on. That a virgin is going to have a baby boy who's going to be not just the savior of the world, but he's going to rule on the throne of David and be the king. There was an announcement initially made to Mary, announcement then to Joseph, but before those two announcements were ever made, there was an announcement made to King Ahaz, and King Ahaz is a wicked king. If you recall from our time in Isaiah, back in the summer, he had even sacrificed his own children to the false gods of the land of Canaan. He was a, a wicked man. He had a little misfortune Two of the neighboring kings had gone together in, in, in an, as allies to attack him. 
It says when Ahaz, this king of Judah, and I got Judah up on the, the map there where you can see where Judah is. When, when Ahaz was, was the king of Judah, the king resident of Aram, and Aram is, it would be uh, you know, to the north, on the other side of the Jordan. And, and he said, and to Pekah, who was the king of Israel. And Israel is the nation just above him. And, and the Israel were, were Jews too. But the house of David had been divided between Judah and Israel. And those in the north had become very idolatrous. They had made a golden calf and said, this is Jehovah. And they were worshiping a golden calf as Jehovah. It was a paganized Judaism, kind of like what we have in America, a lot of paganized Christianity. They don't really preach the truth. That's what was going on. Well, this paganized king in the north, Pika, he, he's an, an ally uh, of King Rezin, and it says they marched up to fight against Jerusalem. <laughs> and that's where King Ahaz is, and that's where Isaiah is, and then they're in Jerusalem, and, and he's marched up, but they could not overpower it. You know why? God wouldn't let them. As wicked as Ahaz was, God was still the covenant-keeping God to his people. And I don't care how bad our times get, God will always be good to us as his covenant-keeping people. He'll always be good, always be good. Anyway, then the Lord said to Isaiah, go out, you and your son, Shear Jashub, and meet Ahaz. Shear Jashub is his son, and his name means a remnant will return. <laughs> He's saying, listen, there's this fight going on. You're going to go to the king. Take your son, whose name means a remnant will return. They're not going to take us away. We're going to win this one. We're going to be okay. Take your son along and go to Ahaz, this wicked king. So he does. And then the Lord said to Isaiah, say to Ahaz, tell him, be careful. Keep calm. Don't be afraid. Don't lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? God calls these two powers, houses that have joined together to come against me and says, they're nothing but a little, little wick that is a stub of a, a wick and it's smoldering and it's going out. Don't be afraid of them. Here's the deal. God is always in control. Always in control. I don't know what you're going in your life, and, and you see this thing is monumental, and God's saying, it's just a smoldering stub. Be careful. Be calm. Don't be afraid. Don't lose heart. Because what your little smoldering stub is threatening you. This is what the Lord, the sovereign Lord, the Most High God, He says... It will not take place. It will not happen. They're not going to conquer you. I love that. He goes on a little further. He says, and within 65 years, Ephraim, which is another name for Israel in the north, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. In fact, in the next chapter, chapter 8, he's going to talk about the Assyrians are going to come and wipe them out, both them and Aram. They're going to both be wiped out and be taken away captive. He says, so within 65 years, they're going down. They're going down. And the Lord spoke to Ahaz. And he said, ask the Lord your God for a sign. This is the only place in the Bible I know where God tells somebody to ask for a sign. A lot of places where people ask for a sign, but this is the only place where he tells them, ask for a sign. Ask anything you want, whether it's the deepest of the depths or it's the highest of the heights. He says, you ask for whatever you want. Wow, think for a moment. If God said to you, I'll give you anything in the whole world, what, what would you ask for? I've thought about this, have you? I'd ask for something like, uh, give me another one of these kind of wishes. <laughs> um, in fact, give me like a hundred of them so that I could just keep on asking for anything I want because I'm a greedy person, right? So you're thinking, here's Ahaz, he's got these threats, and God is saying, listen, I've just made a promise. It's not going to happen. I will give you a sign to prove it to you because you're such an unbeliever. And so what do you think he does? What do you think he asked for? Ahaz said, 
I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to test. He is rejecting the Lord. Now, if the Lord tells me to jump, I think I should jump. If he tells me to run, I think I should run. If he tells me to ask for a sign, I should ask for a sign. And he's kind of flipping off God here and saying, I'm not going to ask the true and living God that you worship, Isaiah. I got my false gods of Baal and Ashtoreth and Dagon and all these other fake gods. I'm going to go to them. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. I find it very interesting. He tells Ahaz, I want you, singular, you, to ask for a sign. He rejects it. Then turns right around and says, Hear now, you, you can't see it in English, plural, you. It's kind of like the old English used to have ye and thee to to distinguish between you singular and you plural, and we don't speak that way anymore. It's you, and you just got to know from context what it is. But in the Hebrew, it's very clear. He he first points to uh, Ahaz and says, you ask for a sign, you singular. He rejects it, and then God says, I'm going to give a sign, but not just to you, Ahaz. I'm going to give it to the whole house of Israel. Whole house of David, actually. The Davidic line. I think it's very interesting that in Matthew chapter 1, he gives that long genealogy before he gets to this so he can prove that Jesus is of the house of David. Because the following prophecy, it's going to come in the next verse, has to do with Jesus. Here now, you house of David... Is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? This is warning. This is threat. And then here it is, the miraculous sign. And I think there's two things going on here. There's an application for Ahaz, and there's a fulfillment for the house of David. It goes like this. The application to Ahaz is found in chapter 7, 14 through 8, 22. The fulfillment, not the application, but the fulfillment is found in 714 connected with Matthew 123. The application, there is this son that is then born to Isaiah, not just Shur or Jashub, but he has a son that is born. Isaiah takes a wife in chapter 8, and she is a prophetess, she's young, and she has a son called Mahershal al-Hashbaz. Now, you try saying that two or three times in a row. Mahershal al Hashbaz. Woo! It means hasty to the spoil, haste to the victory. It, it, and it has to do with the prophecy in the next chapter, chapter 8. But, but he has this son, Mahershal al Hashbaz. I practice that. You know I practice that. <laughs> so I got to say that a few more times just because I practice that. I know the next time there's an expecting mother and she's looking for a name for a child, I'm going to say, have you ever considered Maher Shalahashbaz? <laughs> you can call him Maher for short. Yeah, I don't know. Whew. In the next chapter, Maher Shalahashbaz is a sign that when the Assyrians come, they're going to devastate the northern kingdoms and take them away. Okay. That's the application, the present application. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of this little prophecy. In chapter 8, Mahershala Hashbaz is called O Emmanuel twice. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ is called Emmanuel. So I'm working at the Detroit News while I was in Bible college, and I was uh, loading papers into the trucks back in the day. And I, I was loaded. I'd, I'd take one bundle and throw it in a truck, and I had this guy cross. He'd take the next bundle and throw it so that they could keep him at a steady pace. And, and uh, back then, I was kind of in your face with my Christianity, and I would wear these buttons, and, and, and the one button said, have you been born again? And, and the guy said, what's this all about? And I had this one that I made out of wires of the bundles there. It was spelled Jesus. And, and, and so he, I was wearing the one Jesus that day, and he looked at me and he said, you got the wrong kid. I said, what? He said, Jesus, you got the wrong kid. 
I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, his name's supposed to be Emmanuel. I said, what? He said, yeah, I'm Jewish. I know my Bible. His name's supposed to be Emmanuel. He knew this verse. He knew that his name was supposed to be Emmanuel. And I said, oh, no, you, you, got, you're, you, you don't have this right. We all have many names. I'm called Dennis. That's what my mom named me. You should hear the things my wife calls me. <laughs> Besides Den, Dennis. Every now and then, there might slip out a honey. Hey, you know what my kids call me? They don't call me Dennis. They call me Dad. My grandkids call me Grandpa. I got a ton of names. It, it, he shall be called Emmanuel, not because that is the word, but that's who he is. I'm called grandpa because that's what I am. I'm a grandfather. He is God with us. It's not the wrong name. It's the right name. He is Emmanuel to the Jewish people. He should be. He should be to all of us. He's Emmanuel. He is God with us. Listen, the interpretation here hinges on two key words. The first word is the word Alma, which means young woman in Hebrew. And in the New Testament, that Alma is translated Parthenos, which means virgin. But Parthenos was also used 150 years before Jesus was ever born by the Jewish translators of Alma in the Septuagint when they took it from the Hebrew and were going to translate it into the Greek so that the Hellenized Jews could read the scriptures in Greek. They chose the word virgin. Because they knew it was deeper than Isaiah's son, Mahershala Haushbaz. I guess I'm tired of saying that name. I'm already tired. They knew it was much deeper. It, there was something more here. There was a prophecy yet in the future. You see the way prophecy works. Prophecies are given to us about things in the future so that I will live for the glory of God now. When this prophecy was given for the future about the coming Jesus, it had an application for Ahaz in his time that he was supposed to live for the glory of God based upon that future application, future fulfillment, and his current application. He was to apply it. He was to apply it. The second thing has to do with the you singular refers to Ahaz. You get an application, but the you plural has the house of David and refers to all the house of David. He gives the full genealogy in Matthew chapter 1 so that in chapter 2 when he mentions this verse, he says the, the virgin is going to give the son who is Emmanuel, God with us. Here's how it goes. I got a cup of water there. It's being pre-filled. Do you ever do that? I do that with my pop. I pour a little in so the fizz doesn't all go away. Then I pour a little bit more, you know, because I do, if I pour it all in at once, all the fizz goes out, my pop's flat. So I kind of pre-fill it. And the application is like a pre-fillment. The virgin is the Alma, a young woman. We'll be with child and we'll give birth to a son. And so it's going to happen. And in, in, in the application, there's going to be a son that's born, Mahershala Hashbaz. Then we're going to have, and he will be called Emmanuel. Twice it's, he's called O Emmanuel in chapter 8. And then in the very next verse, this is what it says. He will eat curds and honey. And when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, when he gets that age where he can make a moral decision, So I checked that out. At what age do you make moral decisions? It goes on and says here. But before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the good, or choose the right, what age is that? Typically, it is thought by psychologists to be two years old. Some of the more modern psychologists are starting to say at, as early as six months old. I don't know, but he has in mind here that when a child knows the right and the wrong, when they get to that point, the land of the two kings that you dread, that is in the north, Israel and Aram, they're going to be gone. So he immediately applies this to the situation that Mahershala Hashbaz is going to be a fulfillment for him in application. But the real fulfillment is yet in the future. For the house of David. All this took place, it says in Matthew 1, 22, 
to fulfill. I got the pre-fillment up there, but then it gets fulfilled. He fills it to the top. It is now fulfilled in Jesus Christ. What were the words of the prophet? The virgin, here rendered Parthenon. A Parthenos is a virgin. In fact, in the text, they helped define us as we were reading through that passage. That's why I read it earlier. She was a woman who had not had sexual union, did not know a man. She was a virgin. The virgin will be with child, will literally fulfill. She's going to be expecting, and she will give birth to a son. And it says, and they will call his name Emmanuel, and then he interprets it for us because he doesn't know that we Gentiles will know Hebrew. And so he says, it means God is with us. God in the flesh. This is the Son of God. The Son of God. The verse just before this said, and she will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. Jesus, Yeshua, is actually two Hebrew words slammed together which means Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves. Our God saves. You'll give him the name Jehovah saves because he will save his people from their sins. Who are his people? You and I who believe in him as our Savior and Lord. Here's the bottom line that I want to get to today. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is Emmanuel, the virgin born, God with us to save us from our sins. That's what Christmas is about. Christmas is about that. Don't be like Ahaz who rejected the sign. But accept Jesus today. For as many as received him, he gave the authority to become the children of God which were born not of the flesh, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of the husband or spouse, but of the will of God. God the Holy Spirit moves in us and saves us. And you can be a part of that family today. Take him with you today, and you will live. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we've gone in some detail about this passage about Jesus Christ's birth. And Christ starts, and Christmas starts with Christ, and, and Christ is the start of Christmas, and, and Lord, it's, he's the heart of it all. May we as a people be very mindful in all the celebration that's going on that it's really all about Jesus, our Savior, our King. This I pray in Jesus' name, amen.